Um, okay, uh, I will um, start, uh, I mean not start, you started already, so I, I will do the second start, so to say, uh, and um, I will uh, moderate or be, will be one moderator of uh, today's session and I'm uh, uh, very warmly welcome you to, uh, is it the first uh, talk yeah, uh, in the new year, so I wish you a happy and healthy new year 2021. And uh, a very warm welcome to Chris Lang. Uh, I haven't seen you, I just saw your name. Uh, we met uh, in Passau several years ago, I think it was 2013 or 14, uh, where you gave a talk uh, in Passau uh, at Passau University. Uh, yeah, and so I was very uh, open and very happy to, uh, to, 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 to moderate you uh, today. Um, and in Passau, uh, you were, yeah, you had both sides, a critical and quite optimistic side of uh, REDD+. So I'm very, uh, yeah, I'm very happy to know what, um, what's going on with REDD in, in Indonesia or in Southeast Asia. Um, okay, the Climate Controversy Series is organized by Oliver Pai and Frank Seemann uh, of the Department of Southeast Asian Studies at the University of Bonn in cooperation with the Foundation Asia House um, and the Philippine Bureau and Fridays for Future Hochschulgruppe Bonn. Uh, and in the lecture series, uh, experts and activists gives, uh, give talks about uh, climate change uh, in their region and uh, show, how, uh, uh, show the challenges and strategies of the movement. And um, here you see the last, so today we are here uh, 13th of January, and there will be two more talks and one panel discussion in the next weeks. Yeah, and um, yeah, today uh, Chris Lang will give a talk on uh, REDD Plus in Southeast Asia, and I think he will be introduced by uh, Frau Schaffar in a few minutes. Uh, some words to uh, my person. Uh, my name is Christina Grossmann. Uh, I'm a professor for anthropology of Southeast Asia uh, at the Department uh, of Southeast Asian Studies and um, since September. Uh, and yeah, I'm very happy to, um, to join these, uh, this series. And I'm very happy that Oliver Pai organizes this very interesting and inspiring uh, uh, series with a lot of very yeah, known people. Um, so, I think that was it from my side. You mentioned already the recording. Uh, and now I pass over to Nadia Schaffer uh, in order that you introduce Chris Lang. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, hi, I would also like to greet everyone. I'm the second moderator for today. My name is Nadia Schaffer and I'm a student at the Department for Southeast Asian Studies at the Bonn University. And as you can see on the PowerPoint, the topic for this evening's lecture is the false promise of Red Plus in Southeast Asia. And we are very happy to welcome our speaker, Chris Lang, tonight. He's an expert concerning activities of Red Plus in Southeast Asia, as he is a forestry scientist and has run the red-monitor.org website since 2008, providing critical analysis of forest carbon offsetting schemes. Additionally, he is an activist, writer, and has written reports on forests and rights for a series of environmental organizations, including the World Rainforest Movement, the Corner House, Friends of the Earth International, Robin Wood, Urchwald, and Terra, a Thai NGO working in the Mekong region. Chris Lang has worked for many years in Thailand and Indonesia. So thank you very much, Mr. Lang, for giving us a little bit of your time today. Before I hand over to you, I would like to explain or remind everyone how our lecture works. So the lecture that Mr. Lang will give will last for about 30 minutes. And after that, we will have roughly another 30 minutes time for a question and answer session, but also a discussion. Um, seeing that we are a mix of students, audience and co-organizers, I would like to say that everyone is free to ask a questions question and all questions are appreciated and if you don't feel comfortable turning on your camera or your microphone you can simply post your questions in the chat 
Um, and I will make sure that Mr. Lang will get them. So without further ado, I would like to hand over the mic to Mr. Lang. Thank you for being here today. Okay, thank you very much. That was um, very nice introduction all around. Thank you. Um, so now I need to share my screen. Is that right? Okay, let's see if this works. Ooh. Ah. Okay, did that work? Yeah. Okay, yes. so um, I like this um, this slide that you lot produced of the um, of the talk I'm about to give so much that uh, I've used it as the title page of my talk. Um, there's one thing that I have to admit, um, which you'll notice as uh, as the talk goes on. Um, I'm actually going to talk about red in Indonesia rather than red in Southeast Asia. Um, and there's, there's two reasons for that. One is that if I tried to cover the whole of Southeast Asia, I think we'd be here for most of the rest of the week. And the, the other thing, the other reason is that I, I think Indonesia, the, the principles that I'm hopefully explaining during this talk actually apply as well to the rest of Southeast Asia. So hopefully you'll forgive me for focusing in on just one country. Okay, so here's, um, oh yeah, before, before I go any further, I should explain why um, you can't actually see me. Um, so I, I run this website called Red Monitor, and um, which, which the purpose of the website is to look at REDD, which is reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. And one, one of my main um, criticisms of RED is that it's a carbon trading mechanism. And about eight years ago, I came across this press release in the UK about some scam companies that were ringing people up and selling carbon credits as investments. So I wrote something about this, thinking that this was just going to be a one-off and, you know, there's not very much more to be said about it. That was um, eight years ago. I've now written 250 articles about scam companies of one sort or another. And um, obviously the people running these companies get seriously pissed off when I expose their operations as a scam. So as a result of that, I'm kind of very reluctant to have my photograph or streaming images of myself plastered all over the internet. So I, I hope you can, uh, yeah, just live with me being a black square for the time being. Okay, so um, the outline of the talk, I've, I've got about 20 slides and it's split up into three sections, as you can see. Um, I'm, the first section is capitalism. And obviously I'm not gonna do a full on critique of capitalism because that would take rather longer than, uh, than we have, rather longer time than we have available. However, I, I think it's crucially important to do that in order to provide the background for where red in Indonesia comes from and the fatal flaws of red in Indonesia. And then at the end, I'm going to look briefly at some of the developments in 2020 relating to Indonesia forests and climate change. Okay, so we'll jump straight into capitalism. And as, as I said, I've, I'm not, I'm not going to do a full critique of capitalism. Um, but one of the key problems of capitalism is economic growth. And I'll, 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 I'll focus in on economic growth for the next few slides and for the next few minutes that I'm talking. 
I, I, I actually really like this cartoon because this is what always happens when you criticize capitalism. People will always say, so, you know, you have a, an entire economic system fully worked out, don't you? Let's, let's just switch into that. A while ago, I wrote about capitalism on Red Monitor and um, I got the response, any evidence that Cuba or North Korea protect their environment better than the average, which, which I thought was spectacularly missing the point. So I, I'm not recommending that we all move to North Korea, just to make that clear. Okay, so economic growth is a, a fundamental part of capitalism. Basically what happens under the capitalist system is that we get economic growth. Everybody attempts to make a profit, more succeed than fail, the end result is economic growth. And what we've seen is that if economic growth even slows down, governments and central banks will do anything to get it going again. And as we'll see, I mean almost literally anything. And the, the third point I'm going to look at briefly is that the kind of obvious point that perpetual growth on a finite planet is simply impossible. So th this is looking at the second point here. Um, if economic growth slows, governments basically go completely ballistic, or in this case, central banks go completely ballistic. So if you look at the, the graph, it illustrates the amount of quantitative easing, which is basically central banks printing money. I mean, okay, they're buying government bonds and in that way, putting money into the economy. But basically what they're doing is printing money. So you can, if you look at around 2008, you can see the massive amount of money that they pumped into the economy back then. And at the time, you know, it was trillions of dollars and it, it seemed like absolutely unimaginable amounts of money. That was a bit of a blip. And then quantitative easing carried on until about 2018, after which it kind of leveled off. It didn't cut right back, it leveled off. And then with the coronavirus crisis, they have just gone completely ballistic. It's way, 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 way more than it ever was after the 2008 financial crisis. Okay, so, you know, I can almost hear some of you saying that what we need here is green growth. You know, we can do sustainable development and here's the UN Environment Programme on its website has a whole section about the green economy. And, you know, it looks lovely. There's windmills, there's fields, you know, beautiful sunflowers. There's not a person in sight, there's not a tree in sight, but doesn't, you know, everything will be fantastic. We just need green growth. Uh, in 2009, Jason Hickel and Georgos Kallis published a paper asking the question, is green growth possible? And their conclusion is that green growth is likely to be a misguided objective and that policymakers need to look toward alternative strategies. And just as a way of illustrating what they were saying in this paper, um, a sustainable level of resource use is involves digging up about 50 billion tons per year of materials. And that, that actually includes biomass as well. So it's not all being dug up. We passed that figure in the year 2000. In the year 2017, we hit 100 billion tons a year. And by 2050, we're likely to hit 180 billion tons a year. This, this graph is from a 
the Heinrich Böll Foundation in 2012. So everything from 2008 is actually forecast into the future. But as you can see, we're pretty much following what they were predicting. And that ends up going to, uh, and there's, there's been a couple of other studies since this, which basically replicate the findings of this report. And then in 2017, UNEP, the people who are happily promoting green growth as the solution to this whole problem, published a report basic, basically looking at how much resources we're using. And they put into their scenario a price on carbon of $573 per tonne. The current price of carbon is, some, is anywhere, depending on exactly what type of carbon you buy, whether it's an offset or an allowance to pollute. The price is somewhere between 50 cents in euros and $30. If you really try hard, you can find it, you can find carbon credits for more than $30. You cannot find a carbon credit for $573. And if you do, let me know, because that's definitely a scam. OK, so they fed in a number of $573 for a ton of carbon. They put a resource extraction tax in place. And they assumed rapid technological innovation. And the result of all this, which is madly optimistic, in case you've not noticed, the result of all this was that we would be extracting 132 billion tons per year by 2050. So that's well over two and a half times a sustainable level. And even, even with a growth rate of 3%, which doesn't sound like very much, the doubles every 24 years, which means vast amounts of waste, vast amounts of pollution, vast amounts of environmental destruction, doubling every 24 years. So we've got a serious problem with this capitalist economic system. Okay, so now um, moving on to red. Um, last year, uh, Bernice Maxton Lee put out um, put out a book titled "Forest Conservation and Sustainability uh, in Indonesia." Sorry, and um, it's. It's an excellent book. I actually published a book review of it um, earlier on today, in which I wrote that this is a must read for anyone who cares about forest conservation and climate change in Indonesia and globally. It's a really good book. And this, this quote, I think, illustrates particularly well why I like this book so much. So I'm, I'm going to read the quote. Addiction to fossil fuels is what is predominantly causing climate change. If global society does not stop those emissions, it cannot stop climate change. But that enormously significant detail is left out of the neat red plus concept. And uh, I've been working now on red for um, 12 years or so. And to me, this, this statement is pretty much stating the obvious. I've come across it, perhaps, or similar types of arguments very rarely. And in the number of people actually working on red who will think along these lines, I think you can count those people on the fingers of one hand. So there's my um, boot review again. 
And one, one, of the, one of the key things that she points out, that under red, in the rich world, nothing changes. And, and that's because one of the, the fundamental problems with red is that it's a carbon trading mechanism. And what that means is that even if you do reduce emissions from deforestation in one country, that reduction of em emissions is by definition cancelled out if under a carbon trading mechanism, because somebody takes those carbon credits and uses them to emit the same amount of carbon. So the best possible scenario is a zero sum game. And I, I'm not going to go into very much detail about how optimistic that zero sum game actually is. I mean, one of the problems is that the, the forest can burn down. Another problem is that the forest has to remain standing for at the very least 100 years in order to offset, in inverted commas, the emissions from burning fossil fuels. The other serious problem, it, which is related to that, is the time issue. You know, if you get on an aeroplane, and you fly, a certain amount of tons of greenhouse gas emissions will be released into the atmosphere. That's 100% definite that that's going to happen. Again, setting that against hopefully being able to store or absorb that carbon into forests is a wildly optimistic scenario which we will only know whether it's actually been successful in a hundred or in fact in several hundred years time, which is precisely the kind of thing that we shouldn't be doing at this stage of the climate crisis. However, for corporations like Shell Oil, red is absolutely ideal. Because what, what it means is that they can give the impression of doing something about climate change whilst still carrying on drilling for oil. And that's precisely what they're doing in several countries. They recently launched an initiative in the Netherlands where they claim that you can drive carbon neutral, again in inverted commas. And they make that claim because they're buying red carbon credits from various places, including from Indonesia. Okay, this is another quotation from the book by Bernie Smaxton Lee. And I, I, I think this is important as well because what red does and has done over and over again is basically limits the livelihood opportunities of some of the poorest people on the planet by basically restricting their access to forests. And at the same time, there's a, there's a general discourse about deforestation that blames precisely these poor people for deforestation. So under red, deforestation equals climate change. So not only are poor farmers now being blamed for destroying the forests, they're being blamed for climate change as well. So he, here's the quotation. In Indonesia, irresponsible smallholders and ne'er-do-wells are blamed for perpetuating this hell on earth. And what she's re referring to with hell on earth is the fires that burn every year in Indonesia, on, particularly on peatlands. Okay, back to the quotation. The real reason the fires continue, the forest is lost and the climate change gathers pace, is of course much more complicated. It starts not with poor people in poor countries, but with rich countries and their unsustainable economic ideology their obsession with economic growth and their belief that somebody else can always be found to pick up their tab.
Okay, so um, now coming on to some of the things that have happened in Indonesia during 2020. And some of this is as a result of the coronavirus. Some of it is basically ongoing government of Indonesia policy, the kind of things that they've been working on for um, decades and decades. So um, this, this first item is a direct response to the coronavirus and to economic growth slowing down. The government passed an economic stimulus plan in October 2020. And basically what, what this plan does, the government passed it with almost no public discussion of what they were doing. And there were, as you can see in the background photo here, there were, there were large scale protests about, about this omni, omnibus law. And what, what it does is it removes thousands of regulations on environmental and labor protection rights. And obviously the corporations that are going to be benefit, benefiting from removing these regulations are going to be the palm oil and mining industries in particular. And as I, as I mentioned, the, the key aim of this law is to boost economic growth. Another policy that the government has been, this policy the government has been pursuing for a number of years is the food estate program. And this program will basically lead to millions of hectares of new crop plantations. And they're, they're gonna be spread out in Sumatra, East Nusa Tenggara, Central Kalimantan, and Papua. And um, th this is a major, industrial process. It's not, um, I, get, I mean, what, what would be an extremely progressive policy would be to provide help to small scale farmers to provide, you know, whatever it is that small scale farmers might need in order to improve their crops or, you know, what that would take a hell of a lot of research, but it could be done. Or alternatively, I, well, anyway, I, I was going to go into universal basic income, but maybe this isn't the right place to do that. But a discussion about that would be interesting rather than just saying, okay, agribusiness companies, we want you to take the lead. We want massive plantations. And what the government is doing is putting in roads and canals in central Kalimantan alone are going to be spending $450 million just on roads and canals for the agribusiness companies. And then another policy is um, the biodiesel transition program. And on, under this program, we could be looking at somewhere between 9.3 and 15 million hectares of new oil palm plantations. The, the numbers vary. I've seen um, other studies that come up with a figure of 5 million hectares. In any case, it's a massive boost to the palm oil industry. The, the aim of it is supposedly to phase out the use of diesel in Indonesia and replace um, diesel with biodiesel from oil palm. Okay. Um, when red first appeared in Indonesia, um, it probably got the biggest boost in 2007 when the UN climate negotiations took place in Bali. 
and red was going to save the world. I, I don't know if anyone was following red at that time. It, it was the the number of people that were promoting red as the savior, no matter what the problem was, red was going to solve it. Here we are 13 years later, and there are five red projects in Indonesia that have managed to generate carbon credits. Um, so you, you can see the list here, the Rimbaraya project, the Katigan project, the mangrove restoration and greenbelt protection project in Sumatra, Bujong Raba, and the Sumatra Marang Peatland project. And of that, of that 50 million carbon credits generated, only a tiny percentage has actually been sold. I don't know the exact percentage, but um, it's probably around 10%, but I'm guessing a bit there. I'm extrapolating from other numbers. Meanwhile, in the middle of all this, um, last year, the Green Climate Fund approved a payment of $103 million for results-based red in Indonesia. And this was for the period of 2014 to 2016. So in other words, that's during the, that includes the year 2015. Now, obviously the Green Climate Fund has a very short memory. 2015, the fires in Indonesia were unbelievably appalling. They simply ignored those fires. They ignored the greenhouse gas emissions from those fires. And the justification for doing so is, this is a quote from Indonesia's forest reference emission level, which is a document that's been submitted and accepted at the UNFCCC. It basically establishes um, the baseline for deforestation in Indonesia and measures, you know, what's going to be measured for the emissions from deforestation from that point onwards. And what they wrote was, emissions from peat fires are excluded since the historical activity data are not available in Indonesia. And the development of emission factors is complicated and afflicted with high uncertainties. And, you know, the emissions from Indonesia during the fires were in, in a few weeks, Indonesia emitted as much as the entire country of Japan for the year. So, you know, just because red magically just wishes these emissions away. The atmosphere cannot do that. And Norway has also started payments to Indonesia for results-based red this year. This is part of the billion dollar red deal signed in 19, uh, 19 signed in 2010. So 10 years ago, 11 years ago soon. And uh, so far, very little has actually been handed over to Indonesia. And Norway last year made the first results-based payment, also on extremely dubious, um, you know, dubious justification for this actually being results-based. Because since 2010, the deforestation rate in Indonesia has gone up quite dramatically. So to summarize, this, this is uh, my last slide. Um, to summarize, in order to address the climate crisis, we have to leave fossil fuels in the ground. The, the latest 
science on emissions from deforestation is that they contribute about 12% of global emissions, which is a significant amount. But the emissions from fossil fuels amounts to 78%. And that is, that is going up constantly. And unless we address that, the forests are going to go up in flames in any case. A fundamental problem with red is that it's a carbon trading mechanism. And as such, it's not a way of addressing the climate crisis. It is a way of allowing big oil to continue polluting and to continue drilling. And the final point is that unless economic growth stops and in fact reverses, we face climate catastrophe. Okay, thank you. First of all, thank you very much, Mr. Lang, for this very informative presentation. So now that the lecture is over, we can start our question and discussion round. So please, anyone who has a question, either turn on your mic or share the question in the chat so we can start. Nobody wants to start right now. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I can start. Yes. Chris, I thought it's really, I'm really frustrated you didn't mention everything is good now because we have COVID. This is the argument, you know, because of the lower consumption of fossil fuels, everything is fine. And we do not need such programs anymore. This is the argument I hear every day now. What do you think of it? Um, yeah, I've heard this argument as well. Um, where to begin? Um, I, th I mean, it's true. It's true that there has been a certain reduction in fossil fuel emissions in 2020. But it's a tiny blip on the overall emissions. And of course, you know, once we're all vaccinated and COVID goes, or it doesn't go away, but we're vaccinated again, everything will just kick off again. That, that slide I showed you of the trillions of dollars that the central banks are pouring into economies is gonna go somewhere. And it's, you know, it's not gonna go to a bunch of hippies sitting around I, sorry, um, I'm reading the comments. The, this trillions of dollars isn't going to go around to a bunch of hippies who are growing their own hummus in their back gardens in order to feed themselves. You know, it's, it's going to go to in, industry. It's going to go straight into the capitalist system, which supports endless economic growth. And even, you know, I, I, I was reading about lithium this morning, which we need for electronic or need, in, you know, we need for the batteries in electronic cars. And the impacts of mining for lithium are extremely severe. It doesn't just fall out of the sky. So, you know, this, this myth of somehow separating economic growth from basically extractivism it's just that, it's just a myth. And yeah, I, I hear this myth about COVID showing us the answer to climate change over and over and over again. And um, I, I, I can't see any concrete evidence that anything has meaningfully changed. Things are temporarily on hold, possibly. Does it, um, 
Can we open it up? Does anyone else want to add something to that rather than question and answer just temporarily? I totally agree with you, Chris, because I mean, COVID hasn't changed anything at all in the way our economy works, in the way we organize our transport system, the way we organize, produce our energy, the way we produce our food. Um, so yeah, I don't understand the argument at all. It's just a sort of a short term. It's like having an economic crisis, which capitalism has as well. But of course, economic crisis is also not the solution for, for climate change. We need to change the way we, we produce things and also um, reduce the amount of stuff that we produce. So in conclusion, you would argue that a carbon trading system is not the solution or is a system that can't be continued in our today's society because we can't reduce emissions like this, if I understand you correctly? Um, yeah, I, I think we have to do away with carbon trading altogether. Um, which, funnily enough, brings us back to central banks. Um, Mark Car Carney, who used to be the director of the Bank of England, is currently working on a task force to expand carbon markets globally. And the ta task force actually has that mandate. It's not, the mandate isn't to consider whether expanding carbon trading would be a good idea. It's to, to expand carbon trading. And the, the problem with carbon trading um, is that what we have to do desperately and quickly is stop burning fossil fuels. And the problem with carbon training is that it allows burning fossil fuels to continue because all, all you have to do, according to the carbon trading myth, is buy a carbon offset for every ton of greenhouse gases that you emit. But the problem is that's another ton of fossil fuel emissions in the atmosphere. And, the, the, you know, it, it, we, we've seen last year, we saw a series of companies, of oil companies, Shell, Total, I think BP as well, or any, the Italian oil company, who are, who are all saying that they want to start investing in forestry in order to offset their emissions. And they need vast areas of land in order to do this, land which currently isn't theirs. And the sole purpose of doing this is in order that they can continue business as usual for as long as absolutely possible. The, the other um, industry that's very keen on forest offsets at the moment is the big tech industry. So Microsoft, uh, Amazon, Google are all looking at buying forest offsets in order to offset their emissions. And to me, the, the combination of oil corporations and tech corporations basically being able to, to rule on livelihoods in some, some of the poorest areas of the planet is utterly terrifying. Because we're now getting to the stage where the tech companies, the, the satellite images they have of some of these forests are, are almost in real time. And you know, so so they can they can almost react as soon as a farmer 
starts clearing their fields as part of their Sweden cultivation. And, you know, if they have the misfortune to be doing that inside a red project, you know, th that's suddenly no longer possible. It's, you know, it's just not going to be allowed. Um, I have another you? question I oh. would really like to ask to get it on another stage. Uh, you know, uh, I think last week there was this um, decision of the EU in future, 30% of the forest areas should be protected conservation areas. Do you see any correlation between this move that they say they want to protect more areas and make them conservation areas? Do you think there is a connection to the carbon trade? And how do you judge it that they say, okay, we take more forest for granted, we make stricter laws and conserve more areas? Um, yes, uh, you, uh, there's several questions tucked away in that um, question, which I'll try and deal with one at a time. Um, first of all, do, do I think that this is related to carbon offsetting? Yes, I do. Um, um, at the moment, though, I would, I would say that it's not actually explicit. But this whole idea of putting 30% of the planet under some form of protection is basically part of the whole natural climate solutions um, program. And the, the natural climate solutions program to a large extent grew out of red. A, a, few, a few years ago, you know, people started saying red is dead. You know, there've been a significant number of projects that were not functioning as they were supposed to. Red was starting to come along with a hell of a lot of baggage when you talked about it. And so natural climate solutions is actually being promoted by exactly the same people who promoted red more than a decade ago. Not just the same institutions, but the same people within those institutions are now promoting natural climate solutions. And, and it's, it's basically the same thing, except that they're not just looking, just looking at forests. They're now looking at agriculture, fisheries, basically anything you can mention. And what all of these proposals do is that they focus on the specific part of the planet that they're supposedly preserving without addressing the fact that mining is continuing in the same country, that oil palm plantations are continuing, that logging is continuing, that environmental defenders who are protesting against precisely these things continue to be murdered all of that continues to happen. And, and the, sorry, the last thing I want to say about this 30% um, proposal, um, the conservation industry is right behind this 30% initiative for very obvious reasons, because it basically means they're gonna get their hands on 30% of the <laughs> But the conservation industry has a terrible record of human rights abuse. In recent years, WWF has, has come in for, for an, an awful lot of criticism about which it's done very nearly nothing to address the problem. And it, it's not just WWF. It's the entire neo-colonial conservation movement. And there's a serious danger that this 30% initiative 
is, is basically just straightforward neo-colonialism. It's the rich countries basically stepping in and taking over a very large area of land. Sorry, did I cover all the points? I think I went yeah, off. Very good, very time. good, very good. I may. Mm. Your microphone's not on. Yeah, sorry. Can I ask a question? Hi, Chris. Hi, Hi. Christina. Um, thank you. I just, um, when Ibu Inga said about uh, other country will reserve um, the forest, um, and then in Indonesia is actually um, the opening, they change the regulation that minimum 30% forest is need to reserve. So they, they're opening now. So I mean, I think it's important to things um, is not just per state, yeah. Uh, when we talk about the, the um, climate issues that become uh, molecule issues, which mean carbon. I think it's important what um, Chris remind us about um, the, capi uh, the capitalism issue. It's not the molecule. Is is the climate crisis become the the molecule issues crisis? So I think it's it's really important. Then uh, we need to bring. It's not just how one or two state maybe have progress in the context of uh, conversing something, but um, somewhere in uh, somewhere in another place, for example, I think not just Indonesia and Latin America also um, during um, increasing the the what you call it demand on the um, rare earth mineral mineral things is like um, every uh, state shaking to to change the regulation and kind of that. Uh, my question is. Um, Thank you for like um, this. This um, session is uh, um, keep reminding me what the situation and because there is various sectoral issues uh, happening at the moment. Um, you know there is omnibus law and also the way how Indonesian uh, promoting the the rare earth mineral. Even I never seen before how the the governments like even make advertisement about you know. Um, electricity battery that we will uh, become uh, more development in the context if we have a battery factory, for example. Um, it's it's more massive and it's more popular. Um, could you explore about the possibility with the RADD scheme? Maybe it's not in the name of RADD that a possible um, I know before there is there is also in mining, uh, but not really kind of uh, growing. But um, is it? Do, do you think? Uh, because uh, I know that that um, AU, for example, also like express their interest about that, and then um, various uh, state in in Asia, for example, also like try promoting that. Is there any um, initiative or new scam of that? Uh, RADD or things like that to to what you call it legitimating um, extracting continue in 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 the context of uh, lithium and other rare earth mineral. Thank you. I thank you, May. Um, um, yes, it's the short answer to your question. Um, but it's, um, I, get, I mean, one, one, of the, one of the things um, that's appearing is something called biodiversity offsets, which, which is the completely crazy idea that you can destroy forests or mangroves or fisheries or whatever in one part of the planet. But that's okay, as long as you plant some trees or restore a mangrove or declare a protected area for fish somewhere else. It makes, it makes no sense. But exact, exactly 
the mechanism ex is exactly the same as the red mechanism, where or, or the same as any carbon trading mechanism, where the purpose of it is to allow extraction of fossil fuels to continue. And with the biodiversity offsets mechanism, the purpose is to allow extractivism to continue. It's, it's exactly the same thing. And part of the problem is that it's so easy to get tangled up in, in looking at the actual restoration and saying, look, we're working with farmers, you know, we're, we're working with the local community. The local community is planting these trees. We're giving them jobs. And it's all a distraction from the open cast mine that's taking place somewhere else. And, you know, there is, yeah, I mean, it just, it makes, it makes no sense. And another way in which the mining industry specifically related to red, the, mine, the mining industry, of course, really likes red. So, um, the World Bank's IFC, the International Finance Corporation, came up with this plan to develop red bonds, which it was selling linked to a red project in Kenya. And the idea was that it, it was basically exactly like a normal bond issue from the International Finance Corporation. So any, you know, corporations can come along and buy these bonds. What they said was that we can pay any profits from these bonds in terms of carbon credits from the red project, if you would prefer that rather than hard cash. Of course, Corporations being corporations prefer hard cash to something that may lose its value tomorrow. So 100% of them said we would prefer hard cash. So the IFC obviously not wanting to hand over hard cash. It prefers to keep as much money as it can. They wrote in BHP Billiton, the mining company, and they persuaded them to basically buy the carbon credits. And the IFC uses that money from BHP Billiton to pay off any profits on the bonds. The result of which is that BHP Billiton in all its advertising material says that it's a wonderful green company because it's supporting red, which, <laughs> makes once again no sense whatsoever because BHB Billiton is an appallingly destructive corporation. Whether or not it buys carbon offsets from a red project, it makes no difference to the destruction that it has caused elsewhere. Does it, sorry, does that answer the question? I feel like I'm going off on tangents all the time. Okay, I think she said um, that you answered her question. Anybody else um, who wants that? I think Jutta, yes. So hello everybody. Um, Mr. Lang, I try to put uh, together what I have in mind because otherwise it will be a bunch of questions. Um, what I would like to do is to come back to um, that you mentioned the economic growth. And um, 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 if, if, if we look to, to economic growth, I know it is a sort of dogma in, in capitalism today, um, so that economic growth has to be, um, otherwise there will be no eco economy or whatever. Um, but um, on one hand, I doubt that um, protecting a certain part of worldwide uh, forest will really solve the problem. That is one thing. And on the other hand, um, if, if, we, if we go to this fuel thing, um, of course, um, it is difficult. We understand that it's difficult and that these CO2 emissions um, gives a lot of problems with regard to climate change. 
Um, but on the other hand, um, if I if I see um, taking up energy today, and, and I mean we have we have been our economies um, need a certain um, uh, uh, energy. Yeah, we, we can't work without anymore. Uh, otherwise, we have to switch off uh, uh, everything, uh, electricity, uh, uh, TVs, and such things. Um, and, and the hunger of uh, energy um, is growing all over the world. Um, and, uh, and at the same time, um, solar um, and wind cannot replace the, this fuel thing today. Um, what do you think? Is it... Um, a real economic growth problem, or is it more a problem that the wrong branches um, try to grow? Or because, I mean, on the other hand, anyhow, the, the solar and wind, if we want to replace the solar and wind, they have to grow. I hope I can, can make, um, understand what I, would, what I want, to, want to say. If not, <laughs> I will try it again. Um. Yeah, I, I think I understood. Yeah. Can I try and paraphrase your question? Yes, please, um, because otherwise I can I can do it again. Yeah. Yeah. Interrupt me if I'm getting it wrong. Yeah. Correct. So, so what what you're saying is that certain parts of the economy need to grow, such as renewable energy. For example, yeah. Yeah. And other parts of the economy need to shrink, such as oil. You didn't say that, but I'm adding that in. Mm. Right. And so, yeah, the question then is whether that would, yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the, sorry, the, go on. The, the question is, I mean, um, yeah, this is one thing. This is what one is correctly. On the other hand, um, um, I mean, um, the, the, the point is that we that we need this energy and we, we can't replace it all today so um um if 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 we yeah excuse me it is a bit difficult because i have so so many so many thoughts in my mind for the moment and um i don't know do you think that a thought a thought of a trend, uh, a technology transfer would help or i mean for me i think this this simply uh, uh, um Protect, protecting a certain area of forest will not help. That's that's my problem. Maybe shall, shall I try to to sum yes. up what what Please. I think? <laughs> <my Do that. laughs> so maybe maybe a, a, a very simplified yeah question would be uh, to Chris. Um, uh, what is your opinion if we say okay we don't use fossil fuel fossil uh, fuels anymore is it possible to cover the 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 energy need the need for energy globally uh, 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 which we have at the moment so very simplified yeah but this yeah but i think that it is clear uh, uh, Ms. Bosman, it's clear that that um, uh, this is not possible because we know that it is not I mean, the the, the tubes are, are missing, uh, or the, the um, yeah, how do you say that? Uh, we we don't have I... enough solar and such things, yeah, yeah. yeah so, so, but Chris, do you understand? Do you understand my problem behind? Um, I mean, um, this this red thing is a good thing, yes. It's good that it exists. And that it no, gives... okay. Can I just put in there, Yuta? Um, yeah. I think you've made your point already. So Chris is not arguing that red is a good thing, or that uh, I mean, his main point is that red cannot uh, forests cannot offset the emissions that we are producing yeah, in that's the true. global economy. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the true. main problem with red. And uh, so this is the the key point um, that this offsetting doesn't actually reduce emissions but it lets mm -hmm. the companies who are producing the emissions pretend that they are being carbon neutral okay that's that's the big problem with red uh, or one of the first big problems with red mm -hmm. um to to your other question i think it's it's quite uh, clear that of course if we want to stop uh using fossil fuels then we have to stop building coal uh energy plants yeah and stop mm -hmm. extracting oil and coal from the ground um, but so to replace that with renewable energies, we're going to have to build renewable energy. Yeah, yeah but um, that's clear. So we're going to have to build more wind uh, windmills and, and that kind of thing. So, um, but 
does that mean that we need green growth? I think that's maybe where your question is going. And this is, I think, where Chris would say, and I would agree, that no, it can also be green degrowth. So a, a shift from the fossil fuel extractivist economy to a renewable economy, but at the same time reducing um, overall output. That's what we need to be doing. And mm -hmm. I think that's uh, completely possible because um, the whole thing with the you know, electric and batteries and lithium and stuff, it's, it's also a question of, of how much. Now, the, the, the example is, of course, the, the car industry, the automotive industry. So their solution is to carry on doing what they were doing before, but just to sell more electric cars. And this will, of course, then create even more stuff, even more extractivism, even more mining, even more lithium uh, extraction, etc. cetera. Uh, whereas we would be saying, no, we need to shift from a very high um, level input of our uh, mobility systems. This was the topic before Christmas um, and um, shift it to you know, trams and that kind of public transport system, which uses a lot less resources than private uh, car ownership mobility systems. Yeah, so, so I think, um, yeah. Yeah, um, thank you, Oliver. I, I don't really have anything to add to what you've said, I, I, except may, maybe a, a minor, um, a minor, or actually it's quite a big comment. I, I, I think what, um, oh, sorry, it's gone. <laughs> I didn't sort out what I was trying to say before I said it. Um, I, th I think, you know, exactly this point about the car industry. Basically, the car industry is trying to do a direct swap, as Oliver pointed out, from petrol-driven cars, diesel-driven cars, to electricity-driven cars. And these, are, these still need massive amounts of minerals in order to make them. We've, we're still going to have roads full of cars and we won't be able to, you know, walk and ch children will be knocked down and God only knows what else. So I, I think the kind of things, you know, for example, in, in the global north in particular, what, the kind of things that we need to start looking at are sensible transport systems. So, you know, why do we all need an individual car? Why can't we use buses, trams, trains, and, and have those efficiently and cheaply run? That would hugely reduce emissions from transport. And, you know, exactly how you do that, you know, I'm... Um, it, I, 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 don't, I don't think it's particularly relevant for me to say, okay, this is how we implement this in whatever country in the world. But I think a discussion around that sort of thing is absolutely fundamentally important. And it's exactly the kind of discussion that we're not getting around climate change. You know, there was a, there was a meeting this week in France on climate change. And, you know, they were talking about all the usual things that governments talk about when they get together to talk about climate change with the addition of the new addition of nature-based solutions. You know, they'll talk about anything except leaving fossil fuels in the ground, restructuring society so that we actually need a hell of a lot less greenhouse gas emissions in order to function. It, it's like these, you know, these can't be, these are things that can't be talked about. So I, actually, I'm really glad that you uh, raised this question because I, th I think this is precisely the kind of thing that we should be talking about in the context of climate change. Inga? Yeah. I would just ask another question. Um, how do you judge the situation that the German government commissioned a study which 
revealed that there is no less emission through LED plus. It was in December published. Diva was the foundation which made it. It's a sort of independent council organization and it will reveal well not one ton of carbon was saved through the RDDD program. Now the very incredible situation is when they were discussing last week the Germans also went back to the usual thing and it was nowhere discussed and published that red made no sense even though it was clear and it was proven through a study. So who is behind that? I mean, there have been recently several studies. This is the first study directly commissioned by the German government to see whether the Paris uh, aims of 2050 were reached, 15 were reached, and the result was not one ton of carbon. It was even worse. Huge areas which should be protected through LED were cut or burned. And they don't discuss it. They discuss the usual question, like Jutta mentioned, but not this question. What's the background? Yet they suppress such information. Um, <laughs> um, I, I, <laughs> how can I answer that one? I have no idea. But you're right. I mean, you're absolutely right. And yeah, I, I mean, I saw that uh, that German report about red. I haven't, I haven't quite got round to writing a post about it yet. It's about 120 pages long or something, isn't it? And it's one of these reports where the conclusion, the conclusion and the introduction are a bit wishy-washy, but tucked away in the body of the report, there's a hell of a lot of really good information, um, which is very often the case. Um, and what, yeah, governments, yeah, I, your question is a bit like how come the UNF triple C in its 29 years of existence hasn't yet talked about leaving fossil fuels in the ground. It's never been on the agenda. Uh, you know, um, I, you know, uh, <laughs> I don't know. But, you know, there's vested interests. The, the capitalist economic model insists that growth has to continue happening. Yeah. I, I mean, the same thing happens in Norway as well. A while ago, um, Norway is the biggest funder of red globally. And a few years ago, the Norwegian government commissioned a review of its aid to RED. And the report was damning. It was really critical. And the government carried on exactly as if the report had never existed. And, you know, I, I can understand it. If I criticise the Norwegian government, Obviously, I'm kind of biased, and obviously, I'm going to criticize the Norwegian government's funding of RED. But this was their own commissioned study. And, you know, they just ignored it and carried on anyway. I, d I don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't know what to, it's kind of the way of the world, isn't it? Okay, thank you. Um, unfortunately, our time is slowly running out, but I think we have time for one or two more questions. And I think Ms. Grossman raised her hand earlier. Yeah, it was uh, some minutes ago already. And um, my question would be, um, could you um, go a little bit more in detail of the actors who, so to say, keeps the wheel running in Indonesia and in negotiation with the um, uh, international uh, institutions, so to say. So who, who is behind uh, or who, you know, who gains um, the profit in Indonesia, um, uh, 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 continuing uh, the obviously, um, yeah, not really functioning red programs 
And can you see if you um, if you compare it uh, with other countries in Southeast Asia or globally, can you see differences how governments um, react, how governments negotiate? Uh, is Indonesia uh, specifically, uh, I don't know, um, weak, so to say, or or yeah, do you have any uh, comments on a, on a comparative global scale, so to say? Um. I think um, I think Indonesia is actually quite typical in the sense that um, a decade ago or 12 years ago, everyone was talking about red and red was going to save the forests and it was going to stop climate change. And a, quite a large number of red projects were set up. It turns out that stopping deforestation is, a, is an extremely complex issue, as anybody that's worked on forests and local communities and indigenous peoples knows, you know, without any question of a doubt, it's extremely complicated. And, and one of the things that makes it so complicated um, is, is that there's no silver bullet. You can't just say, okay, we're going to make carbon worth X. And just by doing that, we're going to wipe out deforestation, which was basically what Red promised 15 years ago. As long as we get the price of carbon in the trees right, deforestation will grind to a halt of its own accord. It turns out that that's not true. And, um, and I, I think um, you, you mentioned um, who, who's behind these projects. Um, so in Kalimantan, um, there's a couple of projects. There's the Rimba Raya project, which is run by a, pro a, a company based in Hong Kong. Um, there's the Katingan Red project, which is actually run by a, um, an Indonesian company. But it's run by a couple of people who used to be investment bankers. So you know, basically, I mean, neither of these projects have actually made very much money. So it's not like that the, the, there's some kind of elite that's ended up cashing in on red. But that's certainly the idea. That's certainly what both of these companies wanted to do and still want to do. Um, you know, I, the, I've just put a link in the, in the chat notes. And yes, it is the same VW, Oliver, that, um, that fiddled its software. <laughs> and yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I, actually Cambodia is, is also quite similar to Indonesia in, in that 10 years ago, you know, red projects were springing up like mushrooms after the rain. And now, you know, there's maybe two or three and several others have just collapsed. And even, even the ones that are supposedly successful have fundamental problems aside from the fact that they're happening within a capitalist system. You know, in, in order to set up one of these projects, you basically have to work very closely with the government. And one of the dangers of that is that that actually opens up the land that we're talking about to corrupt land deals in the full knowledge of the government. So actually the two red projects that I was just talking about in Kalimantan 
both of them, as the projects were being set up, huge oil palm concessions took over part of the red project. And that happened as well in Cambodia. Um, the Oda Mianche red project had to redraw the project boundary because a sugarcane plantation had just taken out a huge area of the forest that they were supposedly um, protecting. And yeah, the same in another, another red project, the Kyo Sima project in um, Cambodia, exactly the same thing happened, but with a Vietnamese rubber plantation. Um, yeah, I, I mean, there's, I, 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 yeah, there's a few things that wherever you set up a red project, you see the same thing. So they're almost invariably weak on supporting indigenous people's rights, even though that's one of the claims of the red project in the first place. Um, and then um, I, another fundamental problem with RED is that it's spectacularly bad at actually addressing illegal logging or illegal mining within the RED area. Because the idea is that, you know, well, you put a price on carbon and then that makes it financially better to leave the trees standing. But that's only if you're actually receiving some of that carbon money. If you happen to live in a village up the road that isn't part of the project, you see no benefits of red. And the only way you can benefit, or one way that you can illegally benefit from the forest is by going in and cutting it down. And in Cambodia, again, is the classic example where the government is right behind the vast majority of the illegal logging that's taking place in the country. Um, I've just noticed that Yuta has asked a, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Um, has asked a, oh, Oliver's answered it. <laughs> Yuta has asked a question in the comments saying, could we agree that your original idea of red is a good one? Simply the mechanisms chosen are wrong. Oliver answered, not really. I, I would repeat, no, uh, red was a really daft idea. It, you know, it was dreamt up, um, dreamt up basically in the global north in order to address the problem of continuing emissions from burning fossil fuels. Sorry, not to address the problem, but to allow fossil fuels to continue being burned. And that is fundamentally a bad idea. So it's not stopped the burning of fossil fuels and it's not protected forests. Okay, I think this is a very good note to end on actually because our time we already went a little bit over Bec before everyone leaves. Um, as Ms. Grossman mentioned in the beginning, because this is a lecture series, there will be a lecture next week as well. So I would like to hand over to, I think, Isabel, so she can shortly introduce the lecture for next week. Yes, thank you, Nadia, and thank you, Mr. Lang, for your incredible, interesting lecture. I think we all learned a lot. Um, next week, we will welcome Joseph Kuruganan. He is the head of the Philippine office um, of focus on the global south and the topic of next week's lecture will be climate justice drivers in southeast asia which is also a very important topic and i would love if everybody could come next week at this, the same day at the same time and yes thank you for your attention and we will hopefully see you next week Yes, I would also like to thank everyone for their participation today and most importantly, Mr. Lang for taking some time out of your day today to talk with us and discuss with us a little bit and I hope everyone is having a pleasant evening or night wherever you are. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye everyone. Thank you.